This is a story about survival, about three men's courage, about their tenacity, about their resourcefulness, about their luck, but also about their association with the natives, the Aboriginals in the area. They were stranded, shipwrecked in one of the most remote and unexplored coasts of Australia in the early 1800s. But their story begins in Sydney, when they go to take a 30-foot boat to Illawarra to collect timber. There were four Ticket of Leave convicts, Thomas Pamphlet, Richard Parsons, John Finnegan and John Thompson. And they would leave Sydney in May of 1823. The men leave Sydney, they're sailing to the Illawarra to cut timber, cedar. They go to a place called Five Islands, which is a modern day Wollongong. And they almost make it, but a storm comes up and blows them out to sea. And they battle this storm for five days. But it's not until the 11th day that it subsides enough for them to raise a sail. But they're in a serious way already. Their water was depleted, it was gone on the second day. But believing they'd been blowing south of Illawarra and south of Sydney, they set their sails for northwest. They don't have a compass or a chart. They have to sail by the sun and the stars. And they do that for 10 more days. It's the 21st day, the men have been at sea and they see land for the first time. It's this coast they see. But as they approach, they can see the large waves breaking on the beach and they know bringing their vessel too close would be dangerous. They also have another concern. They can see the natives, their fires along the beach as well. So they keep sailing north, not long after John Thompson will die and they'll have to bury him at sea. It's day 24 and the men are desperate. The water and food are gone. But good fortune shines upon them. They can see a stream flowing into the ocean. So they decide to anchor off about a quarter of a mile and Pamphlet would swim in with a barrel and collect some water and bring it back to his colleagues. But he spends an hour and a half in the surf and he's exhausted by the time he gets onto the beach. So he signals to his colleagues to bring the boat in closer and in doing so, they lose control of the vessel and it washes up on the beach and breaks up. The men scurry around and recover the implements and tools they can. But one of the things they recover the next day is a bag of flour. And it's here on this very beach that trio spend their first night. In the morning they track off to find civilization. And it's not very long when they come across their first encounter with the natives in this area, the Aboriginals. And they take great pity on our trio, because they've nearly starved to death while they've been at sea. They're in pretty poor condition. So the Aboriginals give them fire, which allows them to bake that flour they've soldiered off the boat into cakes. They give them fish and they help them keep warm. But the trio are really determined to find civilization. So they head north and they get to the end of the land. They've come across a peninsula. So they head down the western side, but it's on the fifth day they come across their first obstacle. The trio arrive on the beach in the distance and they now realize they're actually on an island. The next morning they go down to check the beach and to their surprise, there's a canoe. They look up the beach, the Aboriginals are standing there next to another canoe and they realise it's actually been left there on purpose. So Parsons and Finnegan paddle across here to Stradbroke Island and they're greeted very well by the natives. The next day Finnegan goes back for pamphlet and they set back towards Stradbroke Island. But they've made a bit of a mistake. The tide is running at full strength and they get dragged out to sea and it takes them five hours to paddle back. And when they make the beach the Aboriginals are really excited to see them. They're jumping up and down and screaming and shouting. And Pamphlet and Finnegan and Parsons think it's because they've made it back alive. But it's probably because they returned their canoe. This is Amity Point at Stradbroke Island. And this is where the trio are now staying with the Aboriginals. And they've learnt that there's a canoe about 10 kilometres down on the western side of the island that they can use to get across to the mainland. So they're tracked down there. It takes them a couple of days. But when they get there, the canoe is pretty much buggered. It's been left in the sun and it's cracked and dried. So they trek back up here to Amity Point and it's where they'll stay with the Aboriginals for about three weeks. And they'll learn to fish and hunt, but more importantly, they'll build their own canoe. And they'll use that to canoe from Amity Point across to the mainland. It takes them in 20 hours to paddle over from Stradbroke Island. 
And because of the mangroves along the shoreline, they've decided to leave the canoe and continue overland. When the trio make the mainland after crossing over from the islands, they trek directly north because they think that's where civilization might be. But it's not long before they find a very wide river, this river here. Now, if Pamphlet's the only one that can swim, Finnegan and Parsons can't, and this is too wide for them to cross. So what they decide to do is trek west, upstream, to find a narrower crossing. And they do that for a month. And it's on the other bank of this creek they arrive. But to their good fortune, on this bank is a canoe. So Pamphlet being the only swimmer, swims across the creek and commandeers a canoe. And they head back down river. And it's not very long before they find another canoe. So that allows the trio to continue their journey back to the mouth of the river. When Finnegan, Pamphlet and Parsons commandeer the second canoe, they're confronted by four Aboriginal men who are actually not very impressed they're trying to steal their canoe. But when the Aboriginal guys approached these Europeans, they realised what poor condition they were in. And they took pity on them. And they went fishing purposely to feed these guys. And they stayed with them for three days before they continued their journey down to the mouth of the river. There's little historical evidence on what happens to the men for when they leave the mouth of the Brisbane River to when they get to Bribey Island. And the reason for that is they've been here for over four months and they'll probably be losing track of time. And the three men come across from the mainland to Bribey Island by a canoe. Now they're very weak, but they spend four weeks here recovering with the Aboriginals, living with the Aboriginals. But in one last ditch effort, they decided to head north along this beach around the island to civilization. They make Malulabar. It's about 30 kilometers north of here. And for some reasons we don't understand, Pamphlet returns to Bribey Island to live with the natives. Finnegan and Parsons, they push on and they make Noosa, which is about another 20, 30 kilometre, kilometres north of Malulaba. But there's a serious falling out between the two men and Finnegan returns to Bribery Island with, to spend the rest of the time with Pamphlet and Parsons, he goes, keeps pushing on north. It's late 1823 and on this very beach where we're standing, Pamphlet and the Aboriginals are cooking their catch of the day when they noticed out in the bay there was a cutter. It's the mermaid with John Oxley and he's exploring the coast looking for a new penal colony. Now to describe the scene they saw I've taken an extract out of Oxley's diary of the day. 29th of November 1823 we rounded Point Skirmish about five o'clock and we observed a number of natives running along the beach towards the vessel. The foremost much lighter in colour than the rest. We were last degree astonished when he came abreast of the vessel to hear him hail us in good English. Later that day, Finnegan returns from a hunting trip with the Aboriginals and Finnegan and Pamphlet tell Oxley about this river they've found south of, in this bay. Oxley is very, very interested and wants to explore it. So the next day he sets out with Finnegan as a guide and they explore the river that Finnegan and Pamphlet tell him about, and he names it the Brisbane River. Now Parsons is several hundred kilometres north of here, but he's starting to see the error of his judgement. It's getting increasingly warmer the further north he goes, so he also returns to Bribey Island. But in September of 1824, he's rescued, ironically again, by John Oxley who's here exploring the Moreton Bay and the Brisbane River. Parsons' story is also published in the Australian of the same year. We're here in front of the commissary building in Brisbane. It's the oldest building in Brisbane, built in 1829, as part of the penal colony. In actual fact, that's why Oxley was exploring Moreton Bay. He was looking for a location for a new penal colony when he found Pamphlet and Finnegan and rescued them. And it was Pamphlet and Finnegan who showed him the Brisbane River, a river he probably wouldn't have found. Because when Matthew Flinders was here in 1799, 24 years earlier, he didn't find it either. It's because Brisbane River was well hidden from the bay. The irony of the story is that Oxley, after being shown where this river is, puts in a favourable report. A favourable report the government then sets up the penal colony here, building behind us, Pamphlet 
gets rescued, he goes back to Sydney. 18 months later, he steals two bags of flour, found guilty, sentenced to seven years back at the new Moreton Bay Peeler Colony. Pamphlet, the very man who found this river and showed Oxley where it was, comes back to spend another seven years here. This is a modern city of Brisbane, but as we've learnt, it probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Moreton Bay castaways surviving and being rescued.